Uh, so welcome everyone to the Psychedelic Sisters panel uh, with Dr. Lani Roy, Melissa Warner and Antonika Hoberg. Uh, it's great to have everyone um, join us and particularly we're umbrellaing this through Mental Health Week here in Australia. Uh, I'm Jules Haddock. I'm the, the founder and president of Art of the Minds, and we're all about uh, celebrating creative community conversations and connections in mental health and wellbeing. So before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to past elders, uh, any emerging elders and current elders and anyone that identifies as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, welcome. So um, people often say, what is out of the minds? Well, um, we're really about, um, by profession, I'm a mental health educator, uh, but I'm also an artist um, and including in that a person with lived experience of mental illness. And, and I know in my own journey of recovery from a child, you know, art's always been my mode of you know, releasing all those sort of toxic self-critical thoughts into a healthy platform and continues like that today. So our festival is really all about uh, looking at creative ways and I guess, you know, that uh, all happens because of our major sponsors who support us, you know, in this journey, particularly Geelong Community Foundation. So if anyone listening would like to become a sponsor or would like to just follow our events each year, just go to artofthemines.org.au. Now, we are um, hell-bent on creating cultural change. And I guess for that reason, I do please encourage you at the end of this webinar, if you can uh, complete the survey link, um, I will put that up at the 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 end of the webinar again. Uh, so you know it would be great if you can give us some feedback, particularly around our grants and funding. That's a bit of our requirement, and to really notice a bit of a shift, you know, in people's awareness of mental health and uh, curiosity with all modes of um, service support. So that is me, Jules Haddock. Um, if you email via Out of the Minds, it'll come to me anyway. But um, I look forward to um, getting the show on the road. So welcome, ladies. Yeah, you're looking very beautiful and colourful there. Um, I guess um, what I'll start uh, doing is just talk to you a little bit about uh, psychedelics in uh, Australia and you know I'm going to hold throw it over to you as the experts to you know describe your roles and and the specific areas uh, of focus that you have in terms of ad education and advocacy around the use of psychedelics so jump on in anyone I can kick it off if you like hi everyone great to be here and thanks Jules for all the hard work you do um I've recently ran my my first event, community event, and yeah, anyone that does this on a regular basis deserves yeah, hats off to you. So thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm a social worker and a psychologist, and I've, I've been a sexual abuse therapist for about fifteen years, and it re yeah it reached a point in my career where, and, and personally as well, where the mainstream treatments that we have on offer just wasn't seeing people getting, uh, you know, healed quick enough, you know, years and years in therapy, making some changes but not that significant shift and, you know, revolving door of um, there's what we call treatment-resistant people, which is a tricky term because I think it, it's not about them being resist resistant to treatment. It's we haven't found the right, mm. the right path for them. So about it was about six ago, years ago now I... Um, went to the jungle myself and, and and drank ayahuasca for my own personal reasons. But then that really kicked off my my career in Australia. And now I um I run the Science of Life Psychology, which is a pre preparation integration service and work with a lot of people who are um, utilizing cannabis and ketamine for depression and trauma and anxiety. Mm -hmm. So that's that's all legal and um, embedded in the healthcare system now. And also I'm a founding member of AMAP, which is the Australian Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Practitioners. And we began that charity um, six months ago when the 
Therapeutic Goods Administration, the TGA, announced that um, from the middle of the year it's now legal for people with major depression, treatment-resistant depression, to be prescribed psilocybin, which is um, known as magic mushrooms, and then um, MDMA for PTSD. So we've created this organisation similar to, you know, social workers have an association, psychiatrists have one, um, but we are, you know, bringing all the multidisciplinary players together and yeah, helping set up that structure because there's a lot of work to be done in the culture and in the background. Yeah. So you're complete trailblazers, which is so exciting. I think it shouldn't have been the psychedelic sisters. It should have been the psychedelic warrior women. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I can yeah. the next one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, fantastic. Uh, mm. What about yourself, uh, and? Antonika, um, in terms of, you know, how did psychedelics become a part of your life personally and what did it open up for you? Well, I opened it up a lot. Uh, I could talk about it for years, obviously, but uh, I fell into psychedelics uh, because I had treatment-resistant conditions like uh, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I had addiction issues uh, with alcohol and over-the-counter prescription meds, you know, just anything I could get my hands on, I was taking to try to numb myself. Um, and I ended up finding psychedelics at a time where I was probably at my lowest. I was pretty maxed out on all of the therapies I was in. I'd been in weekly therapy for two years and I'd been in therapy for years before that. I tried the antidepressants, the antipsychotics, and nothing was working. Um, and I was just getting worse and worse and worse. And, um, my husband conveniently was finishing his psychotherapy uh, diploma and had some experience with altered states. So we, one day he had a, he'd found a, a, a podcast that talked about using psychedelics for these sorts of conditions. And so we found what we needed and then we sat and I uh, took the psychedelics and the next day I was a completely different person. Um, I quit alcohol. I quit all all the substances I was on within that week, um, which is not recommended, I will just say. Um, but it changed the perception of who I was. Um, I think I think it, it was a catalyst for me to see that the things that had happened to me weren't my fault and that I was able to, I, I could change my mind if I wanted to on how those things affected me. And so you know, I think a lot of the substance that I used, which was LSD, which is really well known for curing alcoholism uh, back in, I think, the 1970s, uh, I didn't realise at the time was the thing that actually helped. I think it was the alcohol addiction that really limited me from moving forward. And so the LSD enabled me to move forward past that, which then opened up the whole new world. So while psychedelics are largely responsible for that healing and me being able to move past those addictions, I think a lot of it had to do with stopping the addiction so my mind could open up more mm. um, and so so it really was a catalyst for change and then I sort of had found during those passing weeks and months that I didn't have anyone to talk to about it I didn't have any other women who understood what I was talking about I was a school mum you know I had kids in kindy and so when I did talk to one of my friends about what I was doing, she was really concerned because she didn't know what it was. And they, they were, you know, started talking about me behind my back because I'd quit alcohol. So I lost all this weight and oh, I was changing my life. And they were all really concerned with the way that I was doing, um, which made me realize how isolated I'd begun to feel, uh, which was when I started Googling Australian psychedelics and I found the Australian Psychedelic Society. Yes, I was, going to, I was going to mention that you were and you're the president of the Australian Psychedelic yeah. Society. Yeah. Yeah. So I sort of reached out to them about five or so years ago. And uh, Melissa Warner is one of the co founders, which is so lovely to be here with her. Um, and yeah, I reached out and just started helping out with social media. And then over time, I just sort of kept putting myself into projects and wanting to do more and more and more and more and it became a real infatuation of mine because I really realized how much it was quite upsetting to me that people who needed the healing that I got aren't able to have that safely and comfortably in the world and nobody should be punished for trying to access the same kind of healing that I access because had I not done that I do not believe I would be here at all mm, um, yeah my kids would have lost their mother and I have 
you know, the psychedelic experience to thank for that. So, yeah. yeah. And so I've, I've this year I became the president, which is really interesting and lovely. And I'm really seeking leadership in this space because the leadership is lacking in uh, women in psychedelics. There's not a lot of mentorship going on because there's not a lot of women in psychedelics in Australia. And the ones who are are very, very busy with their families and mm -hmm. working and trying to bring in the money. And so, yeah, I'm really stoked to be here yeah. sharing. So thank you. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's lovely to hear uh, your story. You know, there's a lovely Chinese proverb, you know, out of crisis comes opportunity. And I think, you know, many people with lived experience would profess to that. You become curious about your own recovery, but then once that happens, it's the moving forward to share that with others. Yeah. Uh, Melissa, uh, you're a neuropsychologist and, or neuroscientist, should I say? and a meditation teacher. So what useful knowledge does the science of uh, psychedelics and meditation say about how these altered states affect the brain? Yeah, that's a great question. I might share just a little bit about my background as well. Just yeah, fantastic. That would be great. Some of this as well. Uh, so I guess I came to psychedelics in a strange way in that I was I had never heard of them. And I was in my first year of an arts degree at Melbourne Uni. And I got into arts because I literally had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I was split between wanting to actually study art professionally, um, potentially science, especially medicine. But I just wasn't sure. So I did the most broad course possible. Um, and I decided to study something new, which was psychology. and. We had a recommended reading of The Doors of Perception by Aldous Huxley. And I'd never even heard the word psychedelic before, maybe in the context of Beatles lyrics, which I loved, but that was about it. <laughs> yeah. um, he describes psychedelics as of the plane of art, a perpetual creation, and one day may serve to heal mental illness in the future. And while well, mental illness definitely existed in my family of origin, and I had a great desire to help heal both that circle and also myself. And I also wanted to be an artist. So I had found in, in a word, in a word, my calling. Yeah. And it actually took me about five years. I then actually transferred to neuroscience pretty instantly because I decided that I wanted to understand the biological basis of what he described as the beautific and of healing uh so yeah it took me about five years to actually try psychedelics myself uh, I was told by lecturers when I told them I wanted to be a psychedelic researcher I never tried psychedelics that it was career suicide and wouldn't happen in my lifetime wow so that's, yeah. that's definitely that was a poor prediction yeah. um took me five years to try them. This was largely because, you know, my, my personal lineage is probably more related to Star Trek conventions and classical music concerts and parties. Um, and I decided it was time after I actually experienced the trauma myself, my personality changed dramatically. The person who was really motivated towards uni, the person who was, you know, the life of a party, of a celebration, really easeful and in flow suddenly contracted and I had no idea how to even relate to the person who believed they could study medicine the person who felt at ease and could communicate freely with their friends the trauma changed me pretty instantly this is a combination of uh, sexual assault physical assault emotional assault over time and I knew after all my reading after five years of studying these things that it was the right time to try them myself and I was very lucky I had a few other friends who supported me through this and also my parents also supported me through this after showing them the research very lucky in that way I've even done ceremonial work with um, my parents which has been really meaningful um, I really believe in psychedelic family time <laughs> when it's done intentionally in preparation so it's a, it's, a, it's a different type of monopoly family time. <laughs> yes. Sorry, <laughs> board games and psychedelics, different days. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
and also it's connected me with with friends uh really helped me re-enter my creative uh life which had been shut down by the trauma I actually believed I'd faked a lot of the artworks I'd made as a young younger prior to the trauma and now make art regularly and uh, it wasn't always easy I think that there there I had some really challenging journeys particularly before I started to do more intentional work guided by therapists or experienced individuals and that is what led me to move towards meditation because I realized that while psychedelics open you up to new possibilities to can do to the beauty of the world they can also open you up to parts of yourself that you don't really know how to meet or work with and might be unprepared for and the science it was again the science that convinced me the science behind uh, meditation was so clear that this was a way to and another way to access the unconscious but perhaps also a way to learn how to navigate it consciously I think one of the studies that really convinced me to go deep in the meditation journey was one where um, a group of very experienced meditators and novice meditators or non-meditators were asked to while wearing an EEG so wearing uh, a device that allows us to see sort of uh, patterns in brain activity but asked to suddenly become sleepy or suddenly become creative or suddenly become compassionate or suddenly become energized and focused and the group of experienced meditators could they could actually access the state they were asked to inhabit within minutes mm-hmm. whereas the group who were novice meditators or non-meditators mainly just got stressed when asked to suddenly become creative or sleepy um that's interesting because I often say I've never seen a stressed out monk you know if we think about it I always think that would be quite a funny YouTube for someone to make the stressed out monk because it doesn't make sense so the brain you're saying is becomes sort of rewired in a way that you know any states can shift comfortably Yes, and I think that since psychedelics, as Grof described them as non, uh, non-specific non consciousness enhancers, having a tool by which we can navigate those contents is is really vital. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah um, it, I might just ask um, you, Lani, and thank you, Melissa, for sort of sharing your journey on and we'll continue to obviously unpack a bit more um, from you all. But, Lani, I guess, you know, being um, more ignorant about apart from the Netflix series that I've been watching to see, you know, when psychedelics were pulled off from, I think it was the Nixon government at the time with all the hidden agendas. But many people, when you say psychedelics, they will think just that party, you know, um, Melissa, probably what you were referring to, you know, that party atmosphere. So could you offer some education around, I guess, the safe, and meaningful well we're hearing a bit about the meaningful but the safe ac- aspects of psychedelic use and what that means for you i think i just think it's really important to bust the myth that um that there's one safe way to do this because what we know is that in the clinical trials there's been um issues of abuse even with like really rigorous checks and balances uh, in the jungle, even though it's been used for you know for thousands of years in ceremony and with children as young as ten, it's in, it's embedded in their culture. You know, there's still people going to Peru and having some dodgy experiences with shamans, mm-hmm. and and likewise with um, recreational. You know, a lot of people are doing that beautifully. You know, with intention, with groups of friends. So it it really is about set setting and skill. And me and Melissa talk about this a lot in our programs. What are you bringing to the medicine, your, your mental health, your diagnosis, your attachment style, your addictions? Uh, are you risk-taking? Are you mixing multiple substances? All of those factors is the setting safe. For some people, recreation is what they need because they want to express through the arts and through dance and through creativity. And sitting in ceremony in the dark might be actually really, you know, not okay for them. So... Yeah, whereas me personally, the, the ceremonial work um, is is what I need and that's that long, um, you know, eight hours in the dark in silence. Mm. So there's a very, very personal, nuanced um, approach and there's risks across all containers and there's there's benefits across all of them as well. So 
um, even solo, you know, obviously we don't recommend that as, as a psychologist because um, most psychedelics are illegal in Australia, but a lot of my clients have legal k- ketamine and take their own ketamine at home. And that's, that's in Australia. And they have enormous, um, you know, benefits from that, from meditating with it, from doing yoga and ketamine, um, painting, you know, Qigong, calligraphy. So, yeah, that's solo, ceremonial, clinical um, and recreational and just getting people to really see outside the box and really consider the nuance there. Mm, yeah. Uh, I guess, you know, with both B- Melissa uh, and yourself, um, you've been, and this webinar is an example of that, but in terms of, uh, I know, Lani, you were involved in some research that happened recently for the approval of psychedelics. Uh, did you want to sort of elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, I've, I, um, me and Melissa are involved in lots of kind of different consultations and mm-hmm. and research. I've been involved in research protocol development for psilocybin and eating disorders. I'm also researching ayahuasca as well at the moment. But I guess I was a big advocate for um, the TGA rescheduling, so for the for the laws changing, so that um, we can access this legally. But the complexity, um, and Antonika can speak to this as well, the complexity is that it's currently being costed at um, up to $25,000 for people to have well, yeah. two doses of psilocybin legally because you've got your psychiatrist, you've got the room hire, the importation of the medicine, the assessments, and then two therapists for eight hours mm. twice. So very quickly that gets expensive. So although I'm a huge, huge advocate for clinical legal work, I think the government has to move really quickly to sort this out because people are going to go into the community and, you know, pick a mushroom for free or go to an underground guide because it's cheap and affordable and accessible. And this is where we see um, the clinical container being positioned as the best container, which for some for this context, it, is, it potentially is in the sense of safety and for really unwell, you know, really um, at-risk people. But who's going to be able to pay for it at $25,000? Um, and then what will happen is these really unwell people will now yeah, go into the community and, and sometimes they'll get a, a terrific response and, and other times they won't because there's a lot of um, people who think they're ready to do this work and, and aren't ready. Mm. Uh, Antonika, have you got sort of anything you'd like to add to that as well? Yeah, I definitely do. Um, so one of the, like Lani said, there's so many implications that have come with the TGA change. And it's actually, even though it's opened up this this as an idea, I think we're still quite far away from so many of, of people who actually need it having access because, you know, $20,000, like what? Well, a couple hundred dollars is a lot for some people. So that kind of forces a lot of people to, so so when that TGA change started happening, people got excited because they thought that that meant they were going to be able to access this. And if they were caught with it, it also they thought that it meant that they wouldn't be in trouble. But that's not the case at all. It's still completely illegal for me or for Lani or Melissa or yourself to go out, get it, blah, 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 supply, whatever. Whatever it is we want to do with it is still really highly illegal, right? So the APS has sort of noticed that we have become this middle ground or this bridge between the clinical and the underground spaces because there's people who are having these experiences and taking them into their own hands now and it's happening faster and faster and faster, especially since the TGA change. And that means more people are being taken advantage of by by online scammers or the people claiming to be studied therapists who are going to help them and help them find God or whatever it is that those people are seeking. Um, but that's actually a lot of people could also have the potential to place themselves at a lot of harm by doing that. And so, you know, the purposes of organisations such as the Australian Psychedelic Society, it's just we've, we've sort of been finding that we're bridging this, this gap and providing educational resources and uh, groups so that these people who can't get to the clinical settings or can't go to Peru or Costa Rica or whatever have a place to come and talk to other people about the experiences they're having in the underground because they're not always good. And even some of people will come to us from the clinical space. So people who have been through the trials or whatever haven't felt adequately supported 
come to us because they need somewhere to sit, somewhere to just say, does anyone else feel this way? Um, and so the TGA change, whilst it is very exciting for so many of us, like it's opening a whole new world. It's, you know, there's psychedelic programs that I'm going to be able to be involved in because of these changes. But I feel sad for so many because so many people need what I got still won't take that step because of the criminalization of these substances mm. so yeah and, and, I mean, if you look even at the use of cannabis you know and the research where it's been legalized you don't see an actual rise in use you know no. so you wonder when we'll start learning melissa have you got sort of um you know any reflections about the the future our current and future and and you know where you can see that shift needing to take place to add on to this conversation? Yeah, I think a few places, and I feel this is a little bit informed by my travels this year. Uh, Lani and I attended the MAPS conference in Denver, and I also went to San Francisco and very close San Francisco, Oakland. And these are all cities in which psychedelics are decriminalized. And in Denver, therapy is becoming more and more available as well. And what I observed from this is that there's, yes, medicalization and also research and also official process through the TGA is very important. But I think also decriminalization is important because education and learning and the sense of safety after these experiences can be held a lot easier in a situation where people aren't criminals for taking these substances. As Anthony said, there's going to be a lot more people engaging in this in this work on their own accord, and that is going to come with risks. But we can't stop that from happening. Mm. What we can do is create the cultural container and conditions which will make that safer, make knowledge more available, make systems, uh, and help create systems that will support individuals going through this in, on any path, whether that be ceremonial, spiritual, whether that be with a therapist, whether that be because perhaps some people, I, I know some of my meditation clients actually would feel very uncomfortable uh, being in a group setting, going to a trial. Um, people who have experienced severe trauma sometimes actually can only trust a few people. Mm. So there, there's met, and also obviously young people engaging in recreational use who suddenly realize on the dance floor, oh wait, there's a trauma that's come up. we have done something illegal and perhaps need a safe place to talk about this, as Anthony has said. So we're doing important work through the APS uh, by actually creating these spaces, but I think that there is a larger cultural container that can shift. And as you mentioned, from what I saw in Oakland, what I saw in Denver, there didn't seem to be any consequences to this I do think it can be done wrong I think that looking at for example the model in Amsterdam there are so many people I know who had their first trip in Amsterdam bought psilocybin from the equivalent of a 7-eleven and didn't have the, the skills and tools and had a bad first journey in this context so I think it's a balance yeah it's um I guess a question that I, I can have and it comes from ignorance but often you know many of the listeners will be of the same plane as I am is that you know my appreciation or understanding of psychedelics is that if I take psychedelics I'll see just giant giraffes walking around me and um but is it true that with psychedelics what what can actually happen in your brain is that your amygdala our fight and flight center sort of shuts down a bit so you have a bit more clarity about life that's very much the case for mdma there is decreased amygdala activity in MD on, on mdma which is an pathogenic and tactogenic creating a sense of safety and love and connection uh, mm -hmm. in someone's ex vista of experience psychedelics i think it could go either way in the amygdala but what depending on the set and setting but what they do do is well i guess i'll start from the model objective processing which is actually how our brain helps us navigate the world in the sense that the predictive machinery of our brain is constrained by our prior beliefs. And it's also our brain is also naturally poised between a state of entropy or randomness, but also constrained by these prior beliefs and our predictive models. And what 
what the current theory suggests is that psychedelics shift the brain towards a bit more of this entropy and randomness, allowing a less constrained form of thinking, allowing perspectives to be a bit more fluid and shifts, and also it increases communication throughout several brains, throughout the brain, throughout different networks that don't normally communicate. This model is called the Rebus model, relaxed beliefs under psychedelic states. And there's also been another update with that where they're also exploring uh, um, revised beliefs under psychedelic states. Not only do they relax, but there's a greater chance you can revise your beliefs in psychedelic states. Yeah, that's so, interesting because, well, I'll just, um, sorry for interrupting you there, but I know that both you and Lani have been uh, involved in post-traumatic workshops as well, particularly um, for women who have experienced abuse. So I guess that's sort of, you know, if you want to sort of elaborate a little bit more on what those workshops sort of look like for people. Yeah, it's a combination. We actually go through a whole process because there is so much to this understanding how trauma affects the body itself, which again is a massive shift once we do processing. Uh, it really shifts our, our biases, our heuristics, our models of the world towards protection, towards um, greater fear. Um, and this is something that is really hard to shift. People also often shift their nervous system state to fight or flight. It's hard to enter relaxed uh, parasympathetic nervous system state. So part of it is psychoeducation on that. Other elements include meditation, empowering tools, um, for example, even practices you can do in nature, practices for having sort of spaces in your home, ritualistic spaces, altars, and uh, also how psychedelics can both benefit and what the risks are for those who have experienced trauma. Mm -hmm. Because I guess something I do want to emphasize here is while you, you, psychedelic states can be beautiful, expansive, can guide us to greater wisdom of ourselves, reveal limiting beliefs and perspectives, it can also, as I said, non-conscious, uh, uh, unspecific consciousness enhances. And we have to be careful and have tools to be able to discern the wisdoms on psychedelics, to discern what potentially is um a really helpful new perspective and being in touch with our most compassionate wise loving self and what is perhaps a really loud voice that a protective or self-limiting part mm. so giving people the tools to explore that and um also creating spaces for conversation and community i'm sure alana has a few things to add to that as well yeah probably just the segue into internal family systems therapy which i'm sure many of you um, are aware of, but parts work is really common across all the psychedelics. Um, and I guess one thing to consider is that if 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 you don't have consent with a lot of your system, um, people can have a very strong psychedelic such as ayahuasca or psilocybin, and too much is revealed too quickly. You know, they all their defenses are uh, are taken away. They can no longer dissociate. They can no longer run, hide. They are there. They're with their trauma. Um, and for many, that's an incredible opportunity for growth and for somatic releases and for actually piecing together some of the puzzle, maybe memories, episodic memories, or understanding who the offenders were or, you know, the larger context. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it's a lot on the system. So we really do, in our course, encourage people to get to know their parts. Do they have, you know, an inner critic, a self-harming part, um, a part that struggles with boundaries, you know, really mapping all that out really clearly because when you enter the psychedelic state, that stuff can be amplified and then it's it can be amplified in the weeks after at work with your family, with your children. And, again, this is beautiful work, but having the awareness and having that kind of head start and some, some strategies in place, well, what if the urge to self-harm does come up because I've just seen all my trauma when I was five? you know, having a support team, therapists, et cetera, to, to plan for that. And, um, yeah, so I can't stress enough how incredible psychedelics and parts work is. It's potentially one of the most ef effective combinations that I've seen people, um, by understanding their multiplicity, then they can understand, takes away a lot of shame, and then they can start dropping deeper into self, you know, who they are behind all of those behaviours and experiences. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, some of the, um, I guess, the scenarios that you're you're giving there, you know, for someone who's had post-traumatic stress, you do spend half of your life running away, you know, and we all know that at some point we need to face what it is we're we're running into. And and I guess, um, you know, it's lovely to hear that we're becoming a little bit more creative in terms of, you know, the, the treatments. Um, one of the things, you know, I, I sort of want to talk to you a little bit about is, you know, with your support groups, um, how, and are they run like on a regular basis? You know, how do people sort of access uh, those groups or any of your services? Well, Antonika, do you want to speak to what the APS runs and then we can circle back to signs of life as well? Yeah, sure. So um, the Australian Psychedelic Society have started up a lot of special interest groups, um, which sort of started um, last, I think it was last year, about a year ago. Um, I had been getting a few reports from um, women in the community about some uncomfortable sessions that they'd had with underground facilitators and above ground. Um, and I started to notice that when I would speak out loud about these things online, a lot of people, often men, would tell me that these wet things weren't happening in our communities, to which I was like really confused about because they're happening everywhere. So why would they not be happening in just in a psychedelic community? Um, then that sort of made me think, well, geez, these women want to speak about these issues and we need a space to do so. Um, and because, you know, silence is deafening and it only perpetuates the trauma that we've, we're all in. Um, and so I started up the Australian Psychedelic Society Women's Group and I didn't realise how big and how quickly it would expand and how much it was needed until I started it. And now every month we do online calls um, where anyone can come along. You don't have to have your camera on. You don't even have to talk if you don't want to. Um, I highly encourage being a part of it because it's really, really rewarding connecting with everyone on that kind of level. But it just provides this space for women to just let it go, let it down and actually hear other people talk about their experiences and in sharing it one of the main things I've learned over this whole journey is how much sharing my own story changes people's ideas like it changed my whole family's ideas my friends are now sending me articles all the time about psychedelics you know I'm like I know them I know them people you know like uh, so it's just become this you know sharing your story in these groups has become a, like women sharing their stories has become like a, oh me too type thing and I didn't know that other people were struggling with that and it just provides a sense of community that I just never had myself either mm. you know I still I could never even encapsulate that kind of community in my everyday life before psychedelics and now I have been able to do that and cultivate it within a space that really does need it um, but that's also given rise to other special in, special interest groups. So we have a, um, a first responders and veterans group that's just started up. We have a BIPOC group that's just started up as well, as well as a men's group. So we're, we're waiting for other people who want to put their hand up and say, I would like to start up this particular group. Um, and so if anyone wants to, please contact me if you've got an idea for a special little group and you want to be yeah, associated. So, yeah, so... Uh it might be useful, um, Antonika, if you pop your contact into uh, the the into chat, chat, if you like, that, that goes to, um, I think we can send that out to everyone. Uh, yep, yeah. we can. So that'd be great. Um, and I guess part of that is really paving the way, um, Lani, around the decriminalisation laws. Um, mm. And is there some shifts starting to ha happen in Australia? Well, and Antonika can back me up on this in Canberra has from September has seen a shift in decriminalization with a range of substances including psychedelics and the APS it wrote a really clear article should be on your the blog section um, because it's only a, it's only a small amount it's only a specific amount so people need to be educated just because it's decriminalized doesn't mean they can have you know bags and bags of mushrooms that mm -hmm. can be done for trafficking then so possession so um but we are seeing I mean that's that's an incredible shift in from from Canberra to acknowledge that small personal use you know should not be a criminal offense from my understanding of the recent Queensland law is that people will get three warnings before they get a charge so it hasn't shifted to decrim per se but 
the culture of not punishing people for these small small offences and giving them three three chances. Um, we are trying to advocate strongly for changes to cannabis prescribed cannabis medi- uh, driving medication laws because Tasmania is the only state where you can have your legal cannabis and drive as long as you're not impaired. If you were impaired, it would they would assess that accordingly. But what happens is a lot of my patients um, don't take cannabis when it's probably a better option for them because they're scared of losing their license or they or they do take their medication and drive and then live with you know a, a background fear mm-hmm. um, each day so we really need to adapt technologies around Im- impairment versus the substance um, because there's many substances that are actually quite dangerous that pe- that police don't test for you know that people can get in their car and drive for but medical cannabis which is regulated is still you know, illegal to drive for. So we've got a lot of um, work to do around common sense. Long way to go. Mm, yeah. yeah. But, but they I- are doing a trial in, in Melbourne based on cannabis and impairment and driving. And Oh, is that on at the moment? Yeah, it's about to, it's starting soon. So yeah. people are, you know, people are pretty passionate about mm. getting the science and the mm. clarity around this. Do you think there's a bit of a, uh, a blockage from the pharma- pharmaceutical companies because we know if you look at the model in America, you know, when uh, I think it was during the Nixon government, uh, many psychedelics were pulled pulled away because they were having great outcomes and no longer were reliant on having a tablet every day for the rest of the life. So do you think there also is that possible agenda that bubbles underneath? I Personally, don't. I think pharmaceutical companies will find a way to capitalise and make money off this and develop other, you know, synthetic substances and microdosing. And I, 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 I just see they'll see it as another business opportunity, not something to to stop. Um, I can understand why people would believe that because obviously there's a lot of there is a lot of you know perceived corruption in the pharmaceutical industry, but the 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 drug companies that I've come in contact with, a lot of them, to be honest, um, have some of them even have their own personal experiences of mental health and are deeply moved by the field of psychedelics. Yeah. And you know, so they're not all sharks. Some of them are yeah. in, in the business of healing as well. And mm. um, yeah, but well, that, that's really good to hear. And I, I think that the mere fact we're even having this webinar to talk um, and to educate sort of people about what you do and your focus is is fabulous. Uh, what's your thoughts, Melissa, about the future, you know, in this area and where would you like to see things moving? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Uh, I guess I'm referring back to meditation practice again, but the idea of meditation practice is, is a, considered to be a path, that it's a practice. And I also believe that we are in the Western world cultivating our own psychedelic path like like experience like like healing as a practice uh researcher chris timmerman at imperial college recently published an article on the idea of psychedelic apprenticeship and it's reflecting the idea that we are in the process of developing eldership of lineage of holding these therapies in a way which does allow for the most benefit benefit to occur in as a system and for individuals so I do feel like that's a big element, developing systems and culture in which lineage can be held and developed, systems of accountability, which I do think is something that both AMAP, APS, and Prism for Research are all engaging with. Uh, I do think that we'll start to see a lot of um, movement in terms of clinics opening up the next few years, different modalities being implemented, and I do think that having systems that review these processes is going to be important. In America, there's actually I noticed there's a question in the chat about how we do keep things ethical and uh, have these systems of qualification. And there is, because of decriminalization in America, there actually is review based systems for underground semi, well, there are small gray now. Uh, guides. That's something we could do if decriminalization did occur. There could be a bit more of a vetting process, could be a bit more public. I think having that emerge. I also really appreciated that in these cities there were spaces that seemed to be uh, cafes, art galleries, it seemed to be almost created for people to perhaps microdose or to, 
discuss psychedelic scene, to read about psychedelic scene, it seemed to be these curated spaces. I feel like having both clinical spaces, but also spaces for conversation, exploration, is also going to be something we see more of as well. You're on mute, Jules. Thank you. That's how my family likes it sometimes, having me on mute. <laughs> but what sort of advice would you give to someone who wanted to explore uh, psychedelics in a, I guess, a um, safe and responsible way? I guess I would encourage, I would encourage people to find a pretty grounded practitioner to speak to doesn't have to be a therapist but someone who's had their own lived experience of a, a range of medicines someone who's grounded and can talk about the risks and the benefits and just really hold those tensions equally um, I think the media can be very skewed at the moment towards like horror or total awe and it's about you know finding that that middle ground and I guess not rushing um, the preparation because there's so many steps you can take to be ready, more ready for psychedelics, such as, you know, doing breath work, um, altered state work. You know, some people do fasting, vision quests. You know, there's lots of ways to start opening your body up and your mind up and testing out the waters, how that goes with you and how, how it goes with your family. Um, yeah, and just support. And I guess, you know, with psychedelics it comes a lot, uh, big responsibility because you know you will often see what you don't want to see you'll feel what you don't want to feel and, and and hear what you don't want to hear and it's like well what are you going to do about that once you have those messages are you going to ignore it and continue drinking or continue behaviors and that's okay if you if you do plenty of people you know the, the journey is you know circular and long but unless you're you're working with your level of discipline and responsibility I think it can it can go quite badly. You've got to be ready to kind of step step up into into the work. Yeah. Do you want to say any other pearls, ladies? Done it again. Do, yeah, I've done it again. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of questions here, so um, feel free for anyone to step in. But um, this is from one of the participants. Do you have a suggestion as to what the middle ground might look like, such as approved ceremony guides based on past patients' feedback and perhaps a background check working with children, disability checks, et cetera? So AMAP has developed a multidisciplinary credentialing program for uh, format for preliminary guides for fully accredited psychotherapists and for supervisors so I encourage you to look on our website because we've done a lot of consultation on this thanks Antonika <laughs> always helping out um yeah our policies and our roadmap we've done a lot of consultation with the underground with the community with researchers and we'll keep refining it but it's probably the most sensible framework that we can think of that includes capacity for Indigenous people to to work in this space because not um you know, not a lot of Indigenous people are psychiatrists or clinical psychologists, which for a whole range of systemic issues. So we need to make sure that the people in the room are not just, you know, that top tier of, you know, a couple of percent of professionals. We need to make sure it's safe and that there's standards and there's checks and balances, but it actually represents what our clients need. And that's a huge, huge, you know, diverse um, professionals. Um, and, you know, I, I, my PhD area and my research area with ayahuasca is co-production and co-design, which means we actually, you know, I design protocols with people that have the lived experience, whether it's eating disorder or, or ayahuasca, for example. Um, so I think we need to see more and more of that, that the clinical trials are actually employing, you know, past participants that have been through it and have, you know, things to say about how it could be done better, as well as people who have the actual condition that they're trying to, to treat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's some really um, great guides. Did you want to add um, anything or are you ready for another question, Melissa and Tanika? No, I, I think that's pretty well-rounded. You know, I would love to see so much more um, feedback being sent through to the clinical, people doing the clinical sessions and vice versa because the underground has a lot to offer. Um, there's a lot of 
you know, we can learn from mistakes as well as the things we do right in the underground. And I think the therapists coming up and coming in this in this work would, could really benefit. So it'd be really cool to see, you know, for APS and other orgs to still maintain this like middle ground place. I don't I don't think that, you know, we want my this organization wants to be in any particular particular space being in the middle is a great place to be mm-hmm. um and I think a lot of people need that space so it's mm-hmm. you know there's a place for everything here I think um mm-hmm. and I'm really looking forward to seeing what does happen um as safe as possible and of course to add a map you know is committed to to designing anonymous data streams with the underground to feedback mm-hmm. um, all, yeah. all those things that Antonique is talking about so even though we're legal and clinical focused, we're going to be setting up those pathways. You know, if there's any risks happening out in the field or themes or even, you know, really good things happening mm. in the community, well, how can we, you know, consider that in our trials as well? So, yeah, great. Um, there's a direct question for you, uh, Lani. It's um, someone would like to join your team with a view to opening the first multifunctional space for legal psychedelic experiences and making it affordable. So working with some of our commercial partners, being big pharma, this is not their preferred outcome. But I believe it is possible to work between the lines to collect enough evidence it can be done safely with minimal costs. So uh, it's kind of not a question in its own right, um, but a curiousness about uh, connecting with you. Yeah, I, I popped my email in there. I guess there's, there's many um, clinics and sites that have already been established. Um, how many of them are affordable? That's yet to be seen. I think Veterans Affairs will be one um, insurance pathway that will be more likely to pay and make it affordable for their veterans because they they invest so much money in treatment that $25,000 for veterans is actually not a lot of money when you do a cost-benefit mm. analysis. So I think we're going to see NDIS and, and um, Veterans Affairs come on board first, but to get it through, Medicare is going to take, it has to be um, phase three trials and, you know, we're a long way off that for psilocybin particularly. So, yeah, but feel free to reach out. Always happy to chat. Right. Uh, we have another question. What NS... SH comes up as a result of a traumatic trip as opposed to clear insight into previous trauma and how might that be dealt with? What's the NHHS? I have no um, idea it's the acronym I thought. Non-suicidal self-harm? Um, right. Mm, oh. Yep. Mm. I guess something that is challenging about psychedelics and also can be a beautiful thing depending on the trip is it's like like insights or the experiences the visuals thoughts that you receive that you have feel true immediate unmediated and in that way authoritative it can feel like you're receiving messages or downloads and william james described this state as um having a curious sense of authority even when unarticulate and this can imbue these states with transformational power but also potentially can, can, can magnify self-deceptive, self-destructive behaviours. So I really think one aspect is just allowing and encouraging a perspective in which acknowledging its psychedelic states can be contradictory and paradoxical mm-hmm. and that not all insights are true and how willing and how capable are we of holding ambiguity yeah. and holding uncertainty. Yeah. Actually, perhaps mm. giving space for uh, doubt when it comes to some of these really strong messages or desires that can come through and offering, and as Alani mentioned, bringing in a perspective of multiplicity, of that there are many perspectives. Yeah. yeah. I guess um, we're going to have to sort of finish up, but I do have one last question that you might like to answer in a very succinct um, sentence, if that's all right, and this is for all of you to answer. What does psychedelic sisterhood mean to you? Um, Well, there's a quote that empowered women empower women. So for, for me, it's, you know, there's a lot of shadow work in this work. There's a lot of triggers. There's a lot of ego, a lot of pain in this work. So for me, a sisterhood is actually being stronger than all of that and, yeah, being able to have the tough conversations and lead together and really empower each other so that we can, 
you know, empower others together. Right. Melissa, what does psychedelic sisterhood mean to you? I don't think I can top that answer. I really like that concept that if we empower women, empower other women. Uh, I also feel like it's the, it's just the opportunity to connect and it's opportunity to hold each other both in suffering, in challenge, and also in success and recognise that we're all standing on the shoulder of giants and also standing on the shoulders of each other. And I, I love the quote by Mary Oliver that I was saved by the beauty of the world, but I would say that often I've been saved by the beauty of my of my sisters. And um, I think just holding that in our hearts, intention, not just because all sisters have brothers, so it's not just even uh, sisters, but uh, of each other. I guess I'll do my last little bit And Nika, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and we'll um, finish on your notes there. I think psychedelic sisterhood is sort of a new-ish concept for me, you know. Um, you know, I'm sort of, I've, I've been living in Adelaide working alone for a very long time for the Psychedelic Society. And so, you know, I've started networking more and more and more as as time's gone by. And it's been really, it, like Lani said, it's been really empowering to create these networks. But I envision that this like sisterhood extends to us all sort of I don't know my psychedelic work has helped me be a better mother to my daughter and see things that my my mother did and that didn't work for me or whatever you know and so I hope that the psychedelic sisterhood enables and and we're coming to the women's groups that it enables more women to actually connect with each other and see those sort of dark parts in each other to try and like bypass those in a way and create those those comforting connections again um, because there is a lot of tension in female communities and there is those like little dark shadow spaces that we're always working on and um, yeah I think it's understanding psychedelic sisterhood is understanding and compassion and um, I'm just always trying to work forward for the greater good wonderful well thank you um kindly on behalf of art of the minds uh mm -hmm. you three beautiful ladies for joining uh me today we will be uh, well I have recorded this link so um we'll have a chat about how people can sort of access that but um, I do encourage everyone if you could uh, go to this link that's on uh, the screen at the moment we'd really appreciate uh, your feedback um, those people that have registered will will possibly get an email with the link anyway so but thank you again ladies I really appreciate your time and um, have a fantastic day everyone you too. Thanks, Jules. Thanks, Jules. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.